I've heard that bison were as thick as flies on the Great Plains, and I've heard that they were few and far between, especially in the East. Now I'm a plant girl. I study plants. What's a plant girl supposed to make of all of this? That's why I found this book so interesting. The Long Hunt, Death of the Buffalo East of the Mississippi. Let's learn more about the historical accounts of these critters. The earliest accounts definitely record a time of plenty. In 1670, this is almost 200 years after Columbus, Father Francis Xavier traveled through Illinois and saw four to 500 head herds of buffalo. Shortly thereafter, in 1701, there was a tannery built to tan hides near Cairo, Illinois. In less than two years, it shipped almost 13,000 hides. 13,000 hides, that's not that many. But you need to keep in mind the method of transportation that they had to get these hides to the tannery. A green, untanned hide from a bison will weigh a 60 to 90 pounds, depending on if it's a cow or a bull. If I need to carry a hide, one is all I want. And then I get to make the long trek to the tannery with my green hide. Now you say, they also had pack horses back then, let's put it on our horse. But a horse can only carry so much. Maybe we can get two hides. And then I either need another horse or I'm going to get to walk all the way to the tannery. Because of that, I suspect that the radius they were getting the hides from was fairly small. Now it's worth noting that Cairo, Illinois is on the Mississippi River, so they could have come in via boat. However, you still have to get your bison hide to the boat. Jumping ahead to the time of independence nearly, in 1763, a man named Philip Pittman was traveling down the Mississippi River and he noted a couple things. 10 miles north of the Arkansas River, the people living there had a heavy trade in what they called wild beef, which was buffalo, and their hides. The second thing he noted was that between St. Genevieve and Fort de Chartreuse, there was an abundance of buffalo, deer, and wild fowl. Moving into Kentucky, in 1770, a man named James Disson saw about a thousand animals, mostly buffaloes, around a salt knob. He described it that the buffalo had so eaten the soil in the area that the bison could go completely underground. Now when I think about this, the bison are not coming there to get their forage consumption. They're not coming to eat the grass. They're coming to simply lick the soil to get a little salt. That's a lot of tongues licking that soil to make a cave underground. Also in Kentucky, at a place called Big Bone Lick, a man named George Croghan saw herds of deer, elk, and bison. He reported that the buffaloes had beat a path to a lick that was wide enough for two wagons to go abreast of each other. Now I've seen a lot of cow paths in my day, and they're not anywhere near nine feet wide. Most of them are around a foot or maybe two feet wide. So that's barely wide enough to get one wagon wheel down, much less two wagons. Not only are there accounts of the abundance of the bison, there's accounts of their depletion as well. There's many accounts of the bison being shot for sport or for only a certain part of their body. The tongues were considered quite a delicacy and often only the tongue would be removed from the bison. They were shot for their hides. They were shot for the tallow. They were shot for the meat and the marrow bones. One man recorded the depletion like this. We found it very difficult at first, and indeed yet, to stop the great waste in killing meat. Many men were ignorant of the woods and not skilled in hunting. They would shoot, cripple, and scare the game without being able to get much. Others of wicked and wanton dispositions would kill three, four, five, or half a dozen buffaloes and not take a half a horse load from them all. In 1680, a historian, Richard White, asserted that the buffalo had markedly diminished in the lands near the great village of the Kaskaskias. In 1701, that tannery that was built near Cairo, Illinois, shipped 13,000 hides. In 1767, George Morgan wrote, only 1 20th of the buffalo and other game remained that used to be in the state of Illinois. Just a few years later, in 1780, they were importing buffalo robes from the west because they were so depleted in the east. In 1820, just 20 years after Lewis and Clark started their journey to the west, the last known buffalo was spotted in Kentucky. And in 1823, the last buffalo was killed in Tennessee. 
I always thought that when Lewis and Clark left on their journey from St. Louis, that Missouri and areas just east of the Mississippi were fairly pristine, but evidently not. We had already killed most of the bison out of the state. Not only did man directly decrease the population of the bisons through the hunting, but also as he settled, he brought livestock with him and there was an indirect effect. Bison and cattle are both bovines, so the diseases can pass between them very easily. While this is interesting, we can't entirely replicate this. We can't have large herds of bison roaming the plains again, but we can learn from it and it can inform our grassland management today. I think of three things. First, it speaks to me of the historical land cover, especially east of the Mississippi. We know that the Great Plains were covered with prairie, treeless expanses. However, east of the Mississippi, we often think of trees. And while I don't doubt that there were trees, if there were bison, there was also grassland. Second, this speaks to me of the plant's adaptation to grazing. We know that bison were present on these prairies, on the savannas. We know that at times it was grazed as smooth as the floor, so we know those plants were eaten severely. These plants survived that. Those plants thrived under that management and they were adapted to grazing. Lastly, it speaks to me of the grassland's design and the management that was present before settlement. So if wildlife is your interest, consider how would recreating the disturbance of those herbivores impact our wildlife populations today? If, say, you graze livestock, what can we learn about nature's grazing design and how can it impact our management today? If the restoration of rare and declining habitats is your interest, what can we learn about the impacts of these herbivores on our grassland ecosystems? to make our grassland ecosystems better today. It's raining, okay. we should quit. <laughs>